This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 90. Coming up on Space Time, the giant galactic impact which helped shape the Milky Way, the first Orion service module on its way to NASA, and still no word from the Opportunity rover on Mars. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study shows that instead of forming alone, our Milky Way galaxy was involved in a major collision with another big galaxy about 10 billion years ago. This other galaxy, which has now been named Gaia Enceladus, was about a quarter the size of the Milky Way at the time. And evidence of this galactic collision is now littered across the sky in plain sight. You just have to know what to look for. The stars of Gaia and Enceladus make up most of the Milky Way's halo and also help shape the galaxy's thick disk, giving it its inflated appearance. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, are based on the first 22 months of observations by the European Space Agency's Gaia spacecraft. Gaia measures the position, movement and luminosity of stars to unprecedented levels of accuracy. The authors reached their conclusion after looking at the full three-dimensional positions and velocities of some 7 million stars. They found that some 30,000 of these stars appear to be part of an odd collection moving through the Milky Way. The study's lead author, Professor Amina Helmy from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, says the stars from this other galaxy are currently passing through our solar neighbourhood. In fact, the stars in our neighbourhood are deeply embedded in this collection of alien stars, which are almost completely surrounding us. Even though they're interspersed with other stars, the stars of this alien collection stood out in the Gaia data because they're all moving along elongated trajectories in the opposite direction to the majority of the galaxy's 100 billion stars, including that of the Sun. These stars also stood out in the Hertzsprung-Russell or HR diagram. That's an astronomical tool used to compare the colour, mass and luminosity of stars at different ages of their evolution. The HR diagram shows that these stars all clearly belong to a distinct and separate stellar population. The sheer number of odd-moving stars involved intrigued Helmy and colleagues, who suspected they might have something to do with the Milky Way's formation history, and so set about trying to understand their origins. In the past, these authors have used computer simulations to study what happens to stars when two large galaxies merge. And when Helmy compared those to the Gaia data, the simulated results matched her observations. Helmy says the collection of stars she found with Gaia have all the properties of what one would expect from the debris of a galactic merger, which stars from another galaxy were cannibalised by the Milky Way. These stars now form most of our galaxies in a halo, a diffuse component of old stars that were born at earlier times, and now surround the main bulk of the Milky Way known as the central bulge and disk. The galaxy disk itself is composed of two parts. There's the thin disk, which is just a few hundred light years deep, and contains the pattern of spiral arms made by bright stars. Then there is a thick disk, which is a few thousand light years deep, It contains about 10-20% to of all the galaxy stars, yet its origins have been difficult to determine. According to the team's simulations, as well as supplying the halo stars, the accreted galaxy could also have disturbed the Milky Way's pre-existing stars, in the process helping to form the thick disk. The authors became even more certain about their interpretation after complementing the Gaia data with additional information about the chemical composition of the stars supplied by the ground-based Apogee survey. You see, stars that form in different galaxies have unique chemical compositions which match the conditions of the galaxy in which they formed. So if the star collection was indeed the remains of a galaxy that merged with the Milky Way, the alien stars would show an imprint of this in their chemical composition. And when their spectra was examined, they did. The authors have named the other galaxy Gaia and Enceladus after one of the giants of ancient Greek mythology, who was the offspring of Gaia, the Earth, and Uranus, the Sky. According to the legend, Enceladus was buried under Mount Etna in Sicily and is responsible for all the local earthquakes there. In a similar fashion, the stars of the Gaia Enceladus galaxy were deeply buried in the Gaia data. And their collision with the Milky Way have shaken our galaxy, leading to the formation of its thick disk. 
The authors also found hundreds of variable stars and 13 globular clusters in the Milky Way, which follow similar trajectories to the stars from Gaia and Enceladus, indicating that they, too, were originally part of that system. Globular clusters are tight, gravitationally bound spheres containing thousands to millions of stars, which were all originally formed in the same molecular gas and dust cloud at the same time. The fact that so many globular clusters could be linked to Gaia and Enceladus is yet another indication that this must have once been a very big galaxy in its own right, with its own entourage of globular clusters. Based on stellar population, the authors suspect that Gaia and Enceladus probably had about a tenth the mass of the Milky Way, making it just as big as the large Magellanic Cloud is today, one of the dwarf satellite galaxies currently orbiting the Milky Way. However, 10 billion years ago, when the merger with Gaia and Enceladus took place, the Milky Way itself was much smaller, and so the ratio between the two was more like 4 to 1. It was therefore clearly a major blow to our galaxy. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Construction has started at the site of one of the world's new supersized astronomical observatories, the 25-metre Giant Magellan Telescope, or GMT. Workers began hard rock excavations for the telescope's massive concrete piers and foundations at the Las Campanas Observatory site in Chile. Using a combination of hydraulic drilling and hammering, the excavation works expected to take about five months to complete. Excavation is a key step towards construction of the GMT, which is expected to see its first light in 2024. The 25 metre diameter telescope is expected to have a final weight of around 1,600 tonnes. It'll comprise seven 8.4 metre diameter mirrors, supported by a steel telescope structure seated on a central concrete pier. The whole assembly will be housed inside a gigantic rotating enclosure some 65 metres or 22 storeys tall and 56 metres wide. As well as the enclosure and telescope pier foundations, works also commencing on the excavation of a recess in the summit rock for the lower portions of the mirror coating chamber and foundations for a utility building and tunnel on the summit. The most challenging part of the work on the summit is the excavation of the solid rock on the mountaintop to a depth of 7 metres to hold the concrete for the telescope pier. Much of this work is being done using a combination of hydraulic rock hammers and pneumatic jackhammers in order to ensure the integrity of the solid bedrock below the pier is undamaged. Engineers expect to remove around 5,000 cubic metres or 13,300 tonnes of rock from the mountain. Vice Chairman of the Giant Magellan Telescope Board, Professor Matthew Collis from the Australian National University, says the new observatory will be Australia's major investment in optical astronomy for the coming decade and ranks alongside the Square Kilometre Array Radio Telescope Project as the foundation projects for Australia's future in the field of astronomy. Australia is a 10% partner in the GMT project, with the Australian National University and Astronomy Australia already deeply involved in designing and manufacturing components for the new giant telescope, including two of the four first-generation instruments. In fact, the ANU is designing part of the adaptive optic system that corrects for blurring in the atmosphere, thereby allowing the giant Magellan telescope to take images ten times sharper than the Hubble Space Telescope. Collis says the Las Campanas Observatory site was chosen because of its location in the southern Atacama High Desert in Chile, one of the world's premier astronomical sites, known for its clear dark skies and stable airflow, producing exceptionally sharp images. Well, the Giant Magellan Telescope is planned to be the first of the new set of extremely large telescopes that are going to go beyond what the biggest telescopes in the world can now do. It will have a set of seven mirrors, each 8.4 metres in diameter, that will give it the collecting area equivalent to a 24 and a half metre telescope. That compares to the biggest eight or 10 metre telescopes that exist in the world today. And the purpose of the GMT is to go beyond what we can do with those telescopes. We want to be able to see the very first stars to form in our universe. We want to track stars orbiting the black hole at the center of our galaxy. We want to see planets orbiting stars near our own sun. And all of those things are going to be possible with the 
power of the GMT. Where's the construction site? Las Campanas Observatory in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. It's in the foothills of the Andes. It's at an altitude of about 2,400 metres and it's about 29 degrees south of the equator. And what's the advantage of building something so high when it comes to astronomy? Well, the advantage of building something at that altitude is that you get above most of the atmosphere. You get above a lot of the water vapour and, of course, a lot of the blurring of the atmosphere. So the higher, the drier and the colder your site is, the better your telescope can do. What sort of features will this new telescope have? I'm assuming adaptive optics will be part of the show. It certainly will. So as As well as having a very big primary mirror, it will also be one of the new generation of telescopes that will have built-in adaptive optics from the get-go. And in fact, a lot of those adaptive optics are being designed and probably will be built here in Australia by our group at the Australian National University. That means that we'll be firing lasers up through the atmosphere to bounce them off the sodium layer about 70 to 90 kilometres up. And we'll use those full stars, those uh, artificial stars, as a way of measuring how disturbed the atmosphere is and then correcting for that disturbance in the same way that noise cancelling headphones work today. You listen uh, to the noise and then you put a signal into your headphones that cancels it out. In the same way we look through the atmosphere, we look how it's disturbing images and then we distort the surface of our mirrors to take out the disturbances put in by the atmosphere and we'll do that thousands of times a second in order to correct the varying blurring of the atmosphere. And that means that our 24 and a half metre mirror will be able to see almost as cleanly as if it were in space. And that means it's going to have 10 times the resolving power of the Hubble Space Telescope and nearly four times the resolving power of Hubble's successor, the James Webb Space Telescope. Will it uh, be looking into the infrared as well or only in the optical part of the band? No, it covers both the optical and the infrared. There'll be instruments that work all the way down to the atmospheric cutoff in the optical, in other words, down into the almost into the ultraviolet, and then out into the mid-infrared, so out to wavelengths as long as a few microns. And that becomes important, not just to look through all the gas and dust in the universe, but also when you're looking that far back in time as this machine will be capable of doing. That's right. Because we're looking far back in time, these objects are redshifted by the expansion of the universe. And that means the features that we're used to seeing in the optical are having their wavelengths stretched out by the expansion of the universe and are shifted into the near-infrared or even into the mid-infrared, which is where we have to chase them in order to run them down. And that's likely where you'll see those popular three stars you were talking about. Yes, although probably what we'll be looking for in part are features that actually uh, start out in the ultraviolet and are shifted into the optical or possibly into the near infrared if they're at very high redshift. So yes, the advantage of the near infrared is that you can see things much earlier in the universe than you can if you're limited to the optical alone. This is one of three great new telescopes that are now being uh, planned and uh, construction is beginning on them. How will this change uh, astronomy as we know it? Well, it's going to be a huge step forward. Up till now, uh, we have been limited by the size of our telescopes and how far we can chase things out into the universe. Having a step of uh, nearly an order of magnitude in the collecting area of our telescopes and nearly an order of magnitude in the resolution with which we can see things makes an enormous difference because being able to see things that are both fainter and smaller by nearly an order of magnitude, it gives us a huge advantage when we're trying to see things so very far away and so very long ago. We're trying to track tiny, tiny blips of light against a vast, background and that means we need to have very sharp images and very sensitive telescopes and it's only this new generation that's really going to allow us to do these things. How does the technology on this one compare to the other two big new generation telescopes now being built which are doing things slightly differently? That's right so this uh, telescope the Giant Magellan Telescope has a small number of very large mirrors so we've got seven mirrors, each of which is 8.4 metres across. So we're trying to make the biggest mirrors we can make today, which are the 8.4 metre mirrors, and then we have a small number of those which we put on a single mount to make a big telescope. The other two telescopes, the uh, American uh, 30 metre telescope and the European Extremely Large Telescope, are even bigger 
The 30 meter telescope is, surprise, surprise, 30 meters in diameter. The European one is 39 meters in diameter. And they're choosing to use many hundreds to a thousand or more smaller mirrors, typically one to two meters in diameter, in order to build up their giant collecting area. Both techniques should work. There's no particular reason to think that one is necessarily better than the other. And they both have some advantages and some disadvantages. When will we see first light? Ah, well, that's something we'd all like to know. When you start <laughs> building a billion dollar telescope, you're asking how long is a bit of string. With something like this, which is completely new and different, it's very hard to predict when it will be. But our current schedule, if everything goes right, has us seeing first light early in the 2020s with the telescope being completed in the middle of the next decade. That's Professor Matthew Collis from the Australia National University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The first operational European Space Agency service module for NASA's new Orion spacecraft has been flown from Germany to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The module was taken to the States aboard an Antonov AN-124 cargo jet. The service module will power and propel NASA's new Orion spacecraft on its first test flight around the Moon. Whereas the Space Shuttle was limited to missions to the space station in low Earth orbit, Orion will carry astronauts on deep space missions, not just to the Moon, but also eventually to Mars and beyond. The European service module is designed to be mated to the Orion capsule, and together the pair will be launched on NASA's new heavy lift rocket, the SLS, or Space Launch System. At more than 100 metres tall, the SLS will be the first space launch system comparable both in size and power to the mighty Saturn V Apollo moon rocket. Designed and manufactured in Germany and Italy, the European service module is based on ESA's successful automated transfer vehicles, or ATVs, the cargo ships launched on Ariane 5 rockets carrying supplies to the International Space Station. This is the first time NASA will use a European-built system as a critical element to power an American spacecraft. The service module will hold the primary propellant fuel and liquid oxygen tanks, as well as auxiliary equipment and consumables for the astronauts. The module is equipped with radiators and heat exchangers designed to keep both equipment and the crew at a comfortable temperature, as well as providing primary long-distance communication systems, avionics and other key systems. The module's main contractor is Airbus Defence and Space, with companies across Europe supplying components. Once at the Kennedy Space Centre, the service module will be connected to the Orion crew module and its adapter in preparation for Exploration Mission 1, an unmanned test flight beyond the Moon, travelling further into space than any human-rated spacecraft has ever travelled. The mission is slated for launch aboard the SLS in 2020. Meanwhile, work's already underway on the second European service module. That'll power a manned test flight around the Moon. The SLS and Orion will eventually carry components to the new Lunar Gateway project, which will see a new space station constructed at the Earth-Moon L1 or Lagrange 1 position, a sort of gravitational neutral zone between the Earth and the Moon, where an object like a space station can remain in position in relation to the Moon's orbit around the Earth. The Lunar Gateway will act as an orbital base for regular manned missions to the lunar surface. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. There's still no word from NASA's Mars Opportunity rover, which has been silent since a global dust storm hit the red planet. The massive storm blanketed Mars in June, July and August. The dust darkened the Martian skies, preventing the golf cart-sized six-wheel rover's solar panels from charging its batteries. Opportunity's last communications with Earth was on June the 10th. It then hunkered down until the dust storm passed. Mission managers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, have been trying to re-establish communications with the rover ever since. The current thinking is that dust from the storm probably settled over the rover's solar panels, preventing them from collecting sunlight. NASA's hoping winds will eventually increase in the next few months at Opportunity's location, blowing that dust off the solar panels and allowing them to do their job. In the meantime, they'll keep trying to re-establish communications with the rover and won't reassess the situation until at least early January. Opportunity was launched from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida three weeks after its twin rover Spirit on June the 7th, 2003, landing on the Meridiani Planum near the Martian Equator on January the 25th, 2004. 
Spirit had touched down just three weeks earlier in Gusev Crater on the other side of the red planet. Both rovers were only designed to operate for around 90 days in the freeze-dried Martian deserts, but continued running for years. In fact, Spirit remained operational for 2,296 days. Eventually, it got bogged in a sand dune with its solar panels pointing away from the sun. It sent its final message to Earth before going silent on the 22nd of March 2010, more than six years after landing. Not bad for a 90-day warranty. Opportunity has continued going even longer, covering well over 5,300 days on the Martian surface. It's been examining rocks and minerals and has travelled more than 45 kilometres to its current location in a valley leading off the rim of Endeavour Crater. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The United States Air Force's secretive X-37B space shuttle is still in orbit, having now completed more than 400 days in space since its launch aboard a Falcon 9 rocket back on September 7, 2017. The unmanned Delta Wing space plane is on mission OTV-5, currently orbiting an altitude of 356 kilometres with an inclination of 54.5 degrees. Now, officially, the flight's testing experimental electronics and three oscillating heat pipes in long-duration space environments. Oscillating heat pipes is a fancy way of saying a radiator filled with liquid. It's thought oscillating heat pipes could provide a lighter, more economical thermal control system for satellite operations. However, the equipment would need to function reliably for many years of satellite operation, suggesting that the OTV-5 mission might need to remain in orbit for a considerable amount of time if it's to successfully evaluate the thermal performance of the technology over realistic timescales. We know the mission also deployed several small satellites while in orbit, and it's rumoured to be engaged in satellite interception and modification tasks, frequently changing its orbit and altitude. The Air Force operates two X-37Bs, both flying out of Cape Canaveral in Florida. The project was originally started by NASA, who were trying to develop a miniature space shuttle which could fit inside the payload bay of their regular space shuttle fleet. The idea being the regular space shuttle would take off from Cape Canaveral or Vandenberg and then deploy the miniature shuttle in orbit. With the mothballing of NASA's space shuttle fleet, the X-37B project was taken over by the US Air Force. And now, instead of being launched from inside a space shuttle, they're launched from the top of conventional rockets. The US Air Force won't say when the OTV-5 mission will conclude. However, all previous X-37B flights have set new shuttle duration records, with the last, the OTV-4 mission, spending 718 days in orbit before landing at Cape Canaveral in May last year. The OTV-6 mission is slated to launch next year aboard an Atlas V in a 501 configuration. And once again, the payload for the mission is remaining a secret. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. SpaceX has announced the delay in the launch of its first lunar mission. The flight, which will carry an Israeli lunar lander, was to launch in December. Apparently, the problem is with SpaceX rather than an issue with the lander. Israeli mission managers say tests with the 585kg lander were proceeding successfully. The original flight plan called for a December launch into what would have been a highly elongated orbit, which would progressively increase in apogee until eventually it encompasses the Moon as well as the Earth. The probe would then deorbit and land on the lunar surface on February the 13th, carrying out experiments and scientific observations for two days studying the lunar magnetic field before system shutdown. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A major global health report has concluded that half of all deaths globally are being caused by just four primary risk factors. The findings in a series of major studies reported in the Lancet Medical Journal show that in 2017, half of all deaths worldwide were caused by either high blood pressure, high blood glucose, high body mass index, or smoking. The data in the latest Global Burden of Disease report warns that improvements in global mortality rates seen in recent years have become less pronounced overall, and rates have even stagnated or got worse in some countries. The report also found that lower back pain, headaches and depressive disorders were the three leading causes of disability worldwide in 2017. 
A new study warns that the major ice sheets could still collapse with less than 2 degrees Celsius warming because of the changes already caused by the use of fossil fuels. Under the Paris Agreements, most nations have agreed to try and limit global warming to less than 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, although some nations will be allowed to continue increasing their use of fossil fuels, a serious point of contention. But a new report in the journal Nature Climate Change suggests that the 2 degree limit won't be enough to stop the collapse of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. A review of science's current understanding of ice sheet processes suggests that both ice sheets may actually have tipping points either at or only slightly above 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Researchers say if the ice sheets collapse, it could lead to irreversible loss of mass and drainage basins, and urgent research is needed to better improve projections. Paleontologists are putting the austral ovinator theropod dinosaur under the microscope like never before. The 7-metre carnivore, which roamed Australia over 95 million years ago, will be examined in detail using the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation Synchrotron at Monash University. The fossilised bones of the Cretaceous-era dinosaur will be subjected to high-resolution three-dimensional X-ray imaging to study internal bone structure and hopefully reveal more about how it made its living. The study should also reveal details about the meat-eater's age and its life history. New research has revealed that the life expectancy of chocolate Labradors is significantly lower than their black or yellow counterparts. The study, reported in the journal Canine Genetics and Epidemiology, looked at over 33,000 United Kingdom-based Labrador retrievers of all colours, finding chocolate Labradors also have a higher incidence of ear infections and skin disease. Specifically, researchers found the average life expectancy of non-chocolate Labradors is 12.1 years. That's some 10% longer than those with chocolate coats. The prevalence of ear inflammation was twice as high in chocolate Labradors, who are also four times more likely to have suffered from pyrotraumatic dermatitis or hotspot. Because the chocolate colour is recessive, the gene for this colour needs to be present in both parents for their puppies to be chocolate. And so breeders targeting this colour are more likely to only breed Labradors carrying the chocolate coat gene. And it seems the resulting reduced gene pool includes a higher proportion of genes which are conducive to ear and skin conditions. Across the entire Labrador population, the most common health conditions found were obesity, ear infections and joint conditions. Amazon's been facing problems across Britain and Europe with its Echo Smart speakers, which are powered by its voice assistant Alexa, going silent due to connectivity issues. The problems emerged just as the e-retailing giant was doubling the number of devices that can be powered by Alexa. See, Amazon's just released eight new voice-controlled hardware devices, adding kitchen appliances and additional home entertainment gadgets. With the details, we're joined by Alex Sahara of Reut from IT Wire. This is where, if you have a cloud-based system, it's the whole thing about centralization and decentralization. In the 70s, I remember my, well, I wasn't, I was only born in 74, but, you know, my dad was working in the public service and they had these Wang computers and they were dumb terminals and you had a, a mainframe, a main system that was uh, controlling everything. And then we came to the 80s and 90s where the computing power went back into you know, the desktops in your home. Now we've gone back to the cloud. Everything's in the cloud. And that includes these artificial intelligent devices. Now we need to have, it's going to come back to the decentralized point where we'll have cloud devices that are more powerful enough to be lived, to working in your own home and not require the cloud for everything. It's like with Google, you can have offline translation in the Translate app, for example. And the same thing will happen, will have to happen with cloud services, you know, AI services, where they'll get updates from the cloud and they'll use the cloud if necessary. But if the link to the cloud is gone, you don't lose the ability to talk to your microwave, because that's one of the things that Alexa announced, or switch various appliances on or off, or have your smart home continue working. You don't want it to be a dumb home just because you lost the connection to the internet. Well, we're talking about Alexa, it's uh, they've doubled the number of devices that can now be powered by the voice assisted system. Yeah, thousands and thousands and thousands of, of different devices. But Alexa probably has the biggest number of uh, connected devices. Google would be a close second and Apple would be third. But of course, all, across all of those different devices, you've got all the main ones from internal air conditioning systems, manual switches, uh, smart speakers, televisions. I mean, various different things you can you can talk to with your intelligent assistant. But what Amazon has done is has come out with things like a microwave oven where you can talk to it and ask it to cook popcorn for you. But you still have to put the popcorn into the, um, the oven, the microwave. <laughs> in the microwave oven. It's not going to do it for you. And, you know, people like Engadget are saying, well, it's a little bit pointless, you know, but it's the beginning. I mean, we're going to see more and more and more of our 
uh, home appliances become connected. But again, we're going to need to have them work in an offline mode. I mean, the whole purpose of having appliances connected online is so that you can talk to it. You can say, look, I want you to wash the clothes for 30 minutes and in, on the quick cycle and, um, and then send me a text message when it's done. The ability to speak to your appliances with a natural user interface by voice is very seductive and it works when it all works. When it doesn't, then you're left with a bunch of dumb devices that, uh, <laughs> that are waiting to get back online. And that report by Alex Ahara royt from IT Wire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 